It is yet another beautiful Thursday, another beautiful day to talk college football. We've got probably the biggest week, the biggest slate of games that we've seen yet in college football. We've got a lot of matchups. We've got seven ranked matchups to talk about today, as well as some other sleeper games. we got some teams on upset alert, our upset picks, and more. The point after episode 12, we are here. Cody, first off, episode 12. I, I mean, it's amazing that we're episode that 12. Great. We're only fourth week into it, getting more consistent by the week. But, Cody, how are you doing on this fine Thursday? Man, you know, I can't complain. Beautiful day outside. Uh, college football is just a couple days away, so let's get back to it. Yeah, and this is a special episode. Cody, it's our one-year anniversary of the point after. Clap it up, clap it up, the point okay. after one year. Um, bro, to be honest, I don't really remember how it started. I think we were kind of, you know, we were in text chains a lot, chains a lot and threads and FaceTiming a lot and stuff about college football. I don't know. It just kind of came out of nowhere, I guess. I don't know where we – somehow came across paths of us both loving college football. And then I think we mutually were just like, you know what, let's just do this for fun. And, you know, I, I thoroughly, bro, I, from bottom of my heart, enjoy doing this with you every single week, twice a week now, which is nuts. Um, Absolutely. You make me, but you make me better, bro. It's like a relationship, man. <laughs> but seriously though, like oh this God. is like a hundred percent. No, this has made my sports broadcasting just a lot better, man. And um, knowledge of the game. So I appreciate you, bro. Let's keep going. The point after the moon. Um, yeah, bro. Any thoughts? One year anniversary. Man, you know, um, like you said, it kind of came out of nowhere. We used to work mm. together mm. in a job and uh, <laughs> we would just kind of talk. We just talk football all the time. It was a football mm. job, but we would talk specifically college football. Um, mm. And it was cool because we were kind of starting to see some of the recruits uh, that would be going to the next level. And it just kind of, Grew from there. Um, I actually remember I came down last fall um, to visit, and we kind of talked about it then um, mm. when we were at the Diamondbacks game. And we were yeah. like, look, we should probably do this. And uh, it started off as just like something for fun, and now we're really doing this thing. So excited to be on this journey with you, my boy. It's been an absolute exactly. pleasure. Can't, can't wait to continue doing it. Just the beginning, and no better way to celebrate it than to talk seven ranked games this weekend, Cody. This weekend has the most ranked games in a regular season since 2015. There's six wow. on the slate. I'd include Florida State and Clemson at seven. We've got seven games to talk about. Let's start out with the biggest one. Six, Ohio State at nine, Notre Dame. Both teams undefeated. Both teams with a lot to prove. Both teams, I mean – loaded offensively and defensive side of the ball. Ohio State comes in as a three-point favorite. This is at 4.30 p.m. Pacific time at Notre Dame. The place is going to be rocking. But, Cody, I want to go to you first. Before we get into keys of the game, what's impressed you most about Sam Hartman? Let's talk about Sam Hartman, and then we'll go to Kyle McCord. Sam Hartman through three games, first season with Notre Dame. What's impressed you most about him? I think for me the biggest thing is there hasn't been a drop-off. You know, sometimes when you go to a new program, kind of takes a little while to kind of get rolling. Um, but in three games, he has 13 touchdown passes. His QBR is over 90. He's thrown for over 16, I think, yeah, over 1,000 yards already in three games. So he's averaging over 300 yards a game. He's averaging four touchdowns a game. And he's not turning the ball over at a high clip. So anytime you compare that with the running back of Estime um, in the backfield, that's where it's going to mm. just take his game to the next level. Um, make those play action passes uh, more effective. Man, the fact that Notre Dame has a big time quarterback now under center, I think that is what's elevated them to not only um, college football contenders, but also just like a an, mm. like an actual possible favorite if they're able to get past this Ohio State football team. Yeah, and hopefully somehow, some way, maybe he can get a seventh year, uh, get another waiver, and go back for one more year for Notre Dame. <laughs> Probably yeah. too long there Don't for college. Believe. <laughs> <laughs> exactly uh, on the other side of it Kyle McCord rocky start but last week was the first game that he was you know solidified as the starter for the whole season I got a two-part question what's impressed you about Kyle McCord one and two as a quarterback actually we'll start with two and then go to one but um what's it like as a quarterback knowing that you're going to be the guy for for a while in terms of 
a quarterback battle maybe for a couple games? And then what have you been pressed by by Kyle McCord? Because uh, he's kind of turned it up recently. Yeah, you know, I think um, I think competition breeds excellence, you know. And so whenever you're actually in an actual position battle, um, I've only ever been in one in my life. And I remember, I'll never forget it. I remember literally looking at the other guy and letting him know, like, look, I'm here to compete with you. If you beat me for the job, cool. But understand, mm-hmm. like, we're not friends. Like, we can be cool off the field, but when we're on the field, it's a competition. Don't take it personal. Mm-hmm. Like, I don't not like you. You don't not like me. But at the end of the day, whoever gets the job, we have to support each other. I think we saw it with yeah. Jalen Milrow this last week, and we were texting each other. When Ty Simpson drove, scored, uh, had a touchdown driving into USF, first person to come off the bench and support him, Jalen Milrow. And I think ultimately, like, I haven't seen if Devin Brown has done that with Kyle McCord, but ultimately I think Kyle McCord has probably played well enough and earned that spot. Um, It was really fun to watch. I think at one point last week against Western Kentucky, uh, Ohio State scored 28 points in like a nine-minute period of game time, which is, if you Mm. think about that, that's insane. That's a ton of points. Um, Mm. But that's kind of what they're used to, high-powered offense and being able to kind of coast in the fourth quarter. So um, I think Kyle McCord – it's been impressive to kind of see when you're battling in a quarterback battle, there's a lot of pressure that comes with that. And he's just been able to get off there and steadily perform at a higher and higher clip. So good job for him. hundred uh, percent. Let's get into some keys of the game, keys to victory. Um, and let's start out with Notre Dame. I got a couple here, Cody, that I'm going to ramble off and we'll get your, obviously your thoughts back and forth. Me being a Notre Dame fan, I, I took some time to get these kind of keys to victory in. <laughs> I'm excited to get them down. But my first one, number one, I think it's got to be – people are talking about, you know, guarding Marvin Harrison Jr., how they're going to guard or cover Marvin Harrison Jr. Mm-hmm. He's going to get his own. I think, number one, Cody, they got to make Kyle McCord uncomfortable, whether that's it's pressuring him, mixing up blitzes, um, either mixing up coverages that he may not recognize, uh, the crowd noise there. I think they got to make him uncomfortable. They've only had six sacks through three games. I, I think they got to get at least three or four. I, I think four is the number – if those edge rushers and linebackers, they looked impressive against Navy bringing the pressure. And this is an Ohio State O-line that lost Paris Johnson Jr., that lost uh, Jones, I believe he's on the Browns, and they lost their center. So they lost three or four guys to the league. So they got some new faces. They're going to be nervous in this game too. But I think making Kyle McCord uncomfortable has got to be the number one. Um, your thoughts on what, what can Notre Dame do defensively to make Kyle McCord uncomfortable and then is there anything receiver wise that they can maybe cover up too because they got a good receiver unit there at Ohio State yeah you know um, anytime you have a quarterback that's newer to big time college football and a Mm -hmm. defensive coach like Marcus Freeman you know he's probably scheming up some crazy boundary blitz with the field drop zone with the tight or with the defensive end linebacker blitz it's crazy you already know he's going to have something cooked up for Kyle McCord but also at the same time, I think you just got to tackle. Whenever you have good athletes like Ohio State does mm. and you get them in space, they're going to get the football. That's just how their offense is set up. They're going to get the football. Can you tackle in space against Emeka Buka, Julian Fleming, Marvin Harrison Jr., and all the other big-time receivers, as well as Mr. Henderson at running back and um, even maybe even Kyle McCord a little bit in the QB mm. run game. So if Coach Freeman is able to draw up those intricate coverages, are they going to be able to rally down and make tackles in space against some really dynamic athletes from Ohio State? 100%. I agree with that. Uh, my number two, I'm going to call this Hartman's heyday, and here's why. <laughs> I, this feels like a game where they're traditionally a running offense for Notre Dame, and they're going to have to run the football against Ohio State. But for some reason, Cody, I got a feeling that they're going to throw to open the run. I feel like Sam Hartman, this is his game to shine. More specifically, explosive plays, stretching the field vertically. Some guys like Tobias Merriweather, 75-yard touchdown last week against Central Michigan. I know it was Central Michigan, but I think those explosive plays will kind of make the safeties go back, safeties go further, the DBs further, so the running game will open up too. This screams Sam Hartman, heyday, 300, 350-yard passing game. Um, what, What can they do offensively to kind of create those explosive plays, Cody? Well, I think that uh, Ohio State is going to try and pressure Sam. I think they're going to try and bring um, more than Ohio State can block. So Sam Hartman's mm-hmm. going to have to stay in the pocket and uh, prove how tough he is. I mean, he's shown it all the four years that he was at Wake Forest. He's an absolute warrior. Um, he'll stand in and take hits as necessary, um, although he never had to take a hit from JT Tuimolo out. So 
You never know. <laughs> Ultimately, at the end of the day, I think that if Sam Hartman can hang in the pocket, deliver the ball to his big time receivers, uh, mm. Chris Tyree, Tobias Merriweather, they're able to run the ball with Estime. I think ultimately, I think this is Notre Dame's game to win. So I think at the end of the day, as long as Sam Hartman doesn't turn the ball over, is efficient in the intermediate and short passing game to open up those play action deep shots to those big time mm-hmm. players on the outside, I think Notre Dame probably wins this football game. Last one. I mean, I think it's it, it's simple, but it's but it's sweet and it's kind of the formula between these two teams. Who can ru- who can run the football? Who can run the damn ball? Like flat out, who can run it? Trayvon Henderson versus Audrick Estime. Um, I mean, who can run the football? Which offensive line is more dominant? I think that's going to set the tone for the game. And, um, yeah, I mean, who can run the damn football? I think that's my my last point of victory for Notre Dame there. Yeah, you know, I think ultimately, I think as long as Notre Dame can be close late, because if you think about it, Ohio State hasn't had any real game pressure. Their defense is giving up 6.5 points a game right now. So they've had no game pressure. Hmm. They've blown everyone out of the water. Their closest game was that first game against Indiana when Tom McCord shit the bed. So ultimately, at the same time, that as as good as you want to say, like, oh, they look good, Indiana, Youngstown State, Western Kentucky. Yeah. At home. <laughs> so, yeah. well, actually, it was at Indiana, the first game. But, ult- like, if you can put game pressure, new quarterback, on the road, first big-time road game, under the lights, prime time, the pressure of I got to get the ball to Marvin Harrison Jr. I got to get the ball to Mecca. I got to get the ball mm. to my playmakers. And he's getting hit and he's seeing intricate coverages. I just feel like ultimately Kyle McCord cannot turn the ball over. And Notre Dame, you have to force three turnovers. If Notre Dame can force three turnovers, they win the football game. Do you think Notre Dame playing four games versus Ohio State playing three is an advantage for him too? Absolutely. Even though it was, wasn't really like a great opponent, but still it's four games. Four games allows you to get the kinks out. Um, it also, it also, hear me out, it also allows you to understand who's redshirting and who's not. The new redshirt rule where guys mm-hmm. have to, like, can redshirt after four games played kind of lets you know who's ready and who's not. So now your roster is really set. And you're not having to worry about like, ah, do I want to get that guy in the game? Do I need to put him in? Do I need to take him out? Um, so... I know some people might not be thinking about that, but ultimately when you think about a roster and think about guys who can make an impact, if we've gotten to that fourth game already and this is now their fifth game, now they're not going to be able to put in a guy, a freshman maybe to like take up some reps. Mm-hmm. Ohio State side of it, what are some keys take away, keys and standout stuff uh, on your end? What, can Ohio, what does Ohio State need to do in order to win this game? Keys to victory for Ohio State. Run the ball effectively. Run the ball effectively. I know it's not what they're used to in terms of like with these big time wide receivers on the outside and Aguka and Harrison Jr. But if they are able to get Travion Henderson rolling and maybe he has 125, 150 yards rushing, I think that will take some of the pressure off Kyle McCord. And it'll also allow Ohio State to go fast, which will keep Notre Dame vanilla in their coverages and they won't be able to do intricate pressures and coverages in the back end. So I think for me, don't turn the ball over, Kyle McCord. Run the football with mm-hmm. Travion Henderson. Travion Henderson has to get 125 yards. I'd say yeah. 20 to 25 carries. And make sure that when you do take your shots in the play-action game, you got to hit him, Kyle McCord. Got to hit him. Yeah, and I think another running back, too, for Ohio State, I forget his name. It's not um, It's not Mayan Williams, but it's the other guy. Uh, freshman. Let me look up right now. Uh, Chip Trey Trainium. Tranium, I think his name is. Mm-hmm. That he's a senior. That dude's been balling recently. He's another guy I think to look out for for Ohio State. Um, and then, yeah, I'm excited to see how Notre Dame covers Marvin Harrison Jr. You know, he's going to have to get his. I think he's a guy that's got to get you know a touchdown or two for yep. this uh, for this Ohio State team to win. But um, there's a lot of key matchups, Cody. But which matchup are you looking forward to most to watch? That's a pivotal matchup uh, for this game on Saturday. Offensive line versus defensive line on both sides. Can they run the football and can they protect the passer? Because we all know that they have dynamic receivers on the outside. They have great running backs in the backfield um, and quarterbacks that can sling it. Can mm. the front four, front five on each side on the offensive line and the front four or front seven, depending on how they decide to set up, can those guys in the trenches handle the pressure 
of being on national TV and in probably the toughest matchup that they'll have to this point. Yeah, that was my that was my answer too. But specifically, the offensive tackle Joe Alt for Notre Dame. I mean, this guy's gonna be the number one tackle off the board. And then the other side, JT Tumalo. Tumalo I can't say these names. I can't say these names. Help me out. JT Tui Moloel. Tui Moloel. Yeah, I mean that's a guy that wants to prove it. That's a guy you know. That's his second round projected pick right now. A guy that you're we're both fa- fans of. Let's see him in the shot in the shining lights. NBC, Notre Dame at night doesn't get much better than that. Player to watch, Cody. To me, if I go Notre Dame, Tobias Merriweather. Tobias, you're a North Pacific Northwest kid. We've mentioned you on this show before. It's time, bro. It's time. It's time for you to have a breakout game. 120 yards, couple touchdowns. Mm. Start to solidify yourself as the best receiver on the team, which is what I think you are. Um, so on the Ohio State side, this screen – JT Tui Moloau, bro. JT mm. Tui Moloau, time to show up, show out, prime time game against a good offense. You're a disruptor on the offensive line in the run game as well as in rushing the passer. Um, he does a really good job getting hands off and being able to deflect passes, intercept passes from the DN position. Um, Notre Dame will probably be trying to get the ball out of Sam Hartman's hands quickly. Like I was saying earlier, the short and intermediate passing game couple opportunities maybe for JT to either bat a pass down or get it knocked up in the air for an interception. So JT Tui Molo out on the Ohio State side. If he has a big game and they can limit Tobias Merriweather, Ohio State might be able to snake this football game away from Notre Dame and South Bend. I like that. I like that a lot. Um, for me, I'm looking up his name because I think his dad played for Ohio State. I'm not sure. Um, but – Ohio State's usually known for their linebackers. I think Tommy Eckenberg's a guy to look out for, a senior linebacker over there at Ohio State. If you got a big ass dude like Audric Estime, you're gonna have some good linebackers that gotta, you know, not nervous to punish and fill those A gap, B gaps, uh, the powers, the dives, the traps, all that kind of stuff like that. He's a guy for Ohio State. And then for Notre Dame, I agree with you, Tobias Merriweather, but I think just the receiver unit in general. I mean, this okay. is a receiver unit that um has been slacked on recently. They're going to need explosive plays, and it's going to come down to Chris Tyree, Jaden Thomas, Jaden Greathouse, who had a great game against Navy, and then Tobias Merriweather. So I'm stoked to see this receiver unit against a really good DB core in Ohio State with Denzel Burke and with uh, Lathan Ransom, who are both Arizona guys as well. But, Cody, we got to go to our picks. Who are you picking to win this game and your score? The last time, top 10 team. Came on the road to Notre Dame was Clemson. And they got smoked. The night game in South Bend, Sam Hartman dealing the ball. I don't think he turns the ball over as much as Kyle McCord does. Give me Notre Dame 34-24 in a classic. Wow. Notre Dame with the upset there, 34-24. No surprise here. I'm going Notre Dame as well. I'm going 30 to 28 with Notre Dame winning. Um, I think it's a field goal away. Or maybe McCord throws an interception late to Ben Morrison. I think that's that's how it that's how she wrote. Oh, you even have who's throwing the pick to who? Hey, that would be bold. That would be bold okay. if I could get that one. Um, that's the game to watch. But the second game, you know, this game's got a lot of hype around it. Obviously, what Colorado's done this season. Um, but it sucks, Cody. I got to mention, it sucks that you know Travis Hunter is not playing in this game. That's got to be the key headline here. But 19 Colorado at 10 Oregon. This is a 12-30 game at Oregon. Um, the over-under on this, I mean, golly, 70 and a half points. It screams touchdowns here. But Oregon's favored by 21. Um, what does Colorado need to do? Um, you know, first road game, first Pac-12 game for Deion Sanders. Big test for the Buffaloes. Colorado needs to ride the most clutch player in college football right now, Shador mm-hmm. Sanders. If you look, I was listening to a podcast the other day, and it literally said in the fourth quarter, his completion percentage, his yards, his yards per attempt, touchdowns, and completions, all either first or tied for first in the country. That means wow. when the, if the game is close in the fourth quarter, you do not want Shador Sanders to have the football if you're the opponent. Mm-hmm. So that being said, Colorado, Shador Sanders, you're going to have to play perfect. You're going to have to continue to play how you played over the first three weeks of the season. You cannot turn the ball over against Oregon. They're a momentum team, and they will start leaning on you, playing fast with that blur offense, 
similar to what TCU started to do in that second half, except that they're better than TCU at. So hmm. ultimately, I think they also have a better defense behind them. Um, so I think Colorado, you cannot turn the ball over. Shador Sanders, you're going to have to be him. And the, I'll say this, the fact that Travis Hunter is out of this game gives Shador clearly the Heisman, like an early Heisman stage for him to really kind of separate himself as that Heisman contender. Uh, for me, a key for Colorado, they're known, they want to be a fast-paced offense. I think they need to slow the game down. Mm. Oregon's the fastest offense in the country. They've been known for that. You know, they kind of birth the no huddle quick offense. I think they got to slow down. I think we got to slow it down there, um, run the clock in the first half. If they can make it a one score game in the first half, they got a really good shot. But they're, for, they're terrible in the first half, every single game. TCU, terrible. Nebraska, close game. And then obviously Colorado State, I think they were losing at half. I'm not sure. I forget or if it was tied. But I think they got to slow the game down. And then my second one, Cody, you can elaborate on this on two. They got to run the ball. They got to run the ball. If they don't run the ball, it's over. They, they, they got to run the ball. They, they've gotten away with it, which is North Sanders, some scrambles, and uh, a Colorado State team that had a lot of penalties, which was nice that extended drives. But they got to run the damn football. Flat out. They got to run the ball. Yeah, you know, I think if Colorado, if Colorado can reach triple digits in rushing yards, now, what will help with that, Shador Sanders, you must use your legs in this game. I'm mm. just saying. I'm not saying you got to run for 100 yards yourself, Shador. But if Shador Sanders has positive rushing yards, let's say 30, 35, just some timely scrambles just to keep drives rolling or even just to make it a positive play to be able to keep their tempo going, um, I think that'll bode well for Colorado. Mm. Then on the other side of it, you got Oregon. Oregon, an impressive team this year, undefeated. Um, they're at home, favored by 21 points. Um, a key guy for me for Oregon. I think a key for them is to feed Bucky Irving, their running back. He got 216 yards this year, three touchdowns, and he's averaging eight yards a carry, which is ridiculous. Him, their whole running back core is averaging like 7.5. They got three guys. Yeah. Um, who knows? Maybe they'll play even Jaden Lamar, too. He's another guy that's gotten some reps, too. But I like him, feed him, but most importantly, ride those zone reads and RPOs, baby. You got a mobile quarterback in Bo Nix who's starting to get his rushing game going late. He didn't really run as much the first couple games we saw against Texas Tech and then Hawaii, run the ball way more. Um, that zone read is going to be really effective, and a guy like Shiloh Sanders is going to have to come down and make a hit. I mean, it's either going to be on the quarterback or the running back with the DN, you know, kind of misjudges that, that zone read RPO there. But that's a key for me, Cody. What about you when it comes to Oregon? And what's impressed you about Oregon? Yeah, I'd have to say uh, for Oregon, keys to victory, like you said, run the football. They got solid four or five backs plus Bo Nix in the RPO zone read game um sub sub a lot and keep those guys fresh and just keep rolling just keep rolling mm. um like you said colorado will probably want to slow the pace down if i'm oregon i am smashing the gas pedal like mm. i'm thinking marcus mariota dennis dixon days when they're just <laughs> <laughs> darren thomas days where they're going every, a play every eight seconds so mm. um oregon keep the pace going colorado you got to slow the pace down also for oregon because Travis Hunter is not locking down one side of the field, those wide receivers are probably, because Oregon's going to be running the football, are probably going to have one-on-one matchups. Troy Franklin, mm -hmm. Gary Bryant Jr., Tez Johnson, Treshawn Holden, those four guys, if they can get loose and maybe all of them have like six to eight catches, watch out. This could, be, this could get ugly for Oregon if they're able to do all that they want on offense. It's loud, too. That, that place is so loud. We played there my sophomore year. It's the loudest stadium. Key matchups. Key matchup for me here, Cody. I'm going to the coach's side of it. I think Sean Lewis versus Dan Lanning. I mean, mm -hmm. Sean Lewis, we've impressed by We've talked about on the show a lot of his play calling. What's he going to scheme up against his Oregon defense, which Dan Lanning's known for his defensive call, being a defensive coordinator at Georgia. But Sean Lewis versus Dan Lanning, that's my key matchup. I'm excited to watch. Cody, your key matchup. Ooh, I'm gonna go with tough. I'm gonna go with those wide receivers from Oregon against Colorado's secondary because I think genuinely that the defense coordinators from Colorado are gonna load the box and they're gonna say, you know what? We trust our DBs to be to be able to lock down Oregon. Do I think it's gonna happen? Maybe not. And is this one of those games where we finally see Cormani McLean, number one DB in the country, number mm. one corner in the country, five star. Mm. 
Everyone said it was going to be him on one side. Travis Hunter hasn't really gotten any tick. Dion said he needed to earn that. Has he earned it? Is this the game where you finally let Cormani McClain get to play? I don't know. Maybe. Might be one of those where it's like, hey, Cormani, we need you because Travis is out. So we'll see. Um, but yeah, to me, those Oregon wide receivers versus the Colorado secondary led by Shiloh Sanders, mm-hmm. um, we'll see if they can get the job. And then you know Oregon's going to take advantage of that too. So when a freshman's in there, hello, uh, freshman on the right side, even especially in man coverage, I don't see them going a lot of man uh, for Colorado, but who knows? Maybe they feel confident in Cormani uh, against those receivers. I like that. Key players. I, this screams Dylan Edwards, like we saw with TCU. They got with with Travis Hunter out. I expect a lot of you know screens, wheels, um, a lot of checkdowns going to Dylan Edwards. But Dylan Edwards, he had a great first game. A couple, you know, not terrible games, but games that you haven't really been highlighted. As it's tough to you know bounce back after you score three touchdowns that had like two hundred fifty all purpose yards against Texas or TCU. Yeah. But <laughs> Dylan Edwards, this screams you freshman show out at Oregon. Uh, who's a key player for you to watch? I think uh, because he's started to really catch the football kind of in between, like in the middle of the field, is their tight end, Harrison. He's a mm. walk-on. He had eight – I think he had over like 70 yards receiving against Colorado State, two touchdowns. Um, and I think that if on the outside they're struggling, they can work on the inside against maybe some slower – some smaller safeties, some nickel, maybe even a slower linebacker working against that tight end, Harrison, from Colorado for me. So we got to go our prediction here. Oregon's favored by 21. Um, for me, Cody, it's tough to pick against Oregon. I love Colorado. I love the story here. And I think if it's a close game, even if they cover, even if it's like a 10-point game, I still think a great thing for, for Colorado. But I think the speed of Oregon gets them. I like Oregon to win this one. I think it's going to be high scoring again. I'm going to go 42 to 28. Wow. Good pick. Ah. Man. It's tough, dude. It's tough. Uh, uh, we believe in Colorado. We believe, Dion. Don't judge us. We believe. This and it's funny. funny. It's funny too. Before you, before you go, it's because like hearing Stephen A. talk about Colorado in this game because he's he's boys with Dion and all these guys that have like fallen in love with Dion. They won't say that they're favoring Oregon, but he's like, oh, I think I think Colorado could win. You know, at least one of their next like, next three games. Which, if you know Colorado schedule, it's. Oregon, USC, then Arizona State. So he's like, obvious. Like, obviously, they're going to be ASU, duh. But yeah. like, it's just funny. But yeah. All right. Your prediction. Tough to pick against Prime. He has those guys believing. And I think Shador is the most clutch player in the country. I just trust Oregon at home. I trust Oregon at home. I'm going to go 44 41 Oregon by wow. three. Third biggest game. And another Pac-12 game, the deepest conference in football. Sucks it's going to be gone after this year. But 14 Oregon State at 21 Wazoo. Washington State, the Cougs at Pullman, Washington. I'm stoked to watch this one, Cody. You got two very underrated teams. Two teams that are still in the Pac-2, I believe. (laughs) They have not figured out where they're going just yet. Yeah, they have not. They have not. Okay, cool. Yeah, 4 p.m. at Fox. Oregon State's favored by three here, but you've got a lot of headlines, a lot of stuff to talk about here. But what sticks out to you when you evaluate and look at this game, Oregon State against Wazoo? I think Washington State, they need to run the football. I don't know if you guys know this, but the leading rusher for Wazoo is who do you think? Who do you think is the leading rusher for Washington State right now? Um, This screams Cam Ward. It's Cam Ward. And guess how many yards he has? Uh, 295. Oh, yikes. Washington yikes. State, we have to be able to run the football effectively if you want to be able to open up that passing game that Jake Dykert and Cam Ward like to do on offense. So, Washington State, if you can run the football even somewhat effectively, again, if you can reach triple digits in rushing, make sure that Lincoln Victor on the edges and in the slot can get the football mm-hmm. screens, quick game, down the middle of the field, Cam Ward making plays in the vertical passing game as well. You have a shot, especially with it being in Pullman. I'm, I'm excited to watch this game. You know, these are two very underrated dark horse teams. Um, one of them's going to win big and, you know, kind of solidify themselves, uh, you know, a higher stake, maybe that audition tape for whatever conference they go to next. Um, but again, both teams, 
I, I don't think get hurt from this when it comes to the Pac-12 standings because I think they're going to end up having to play, you know, Oregon or or uh, USC or Washington again, especially the Apple Cup for Wazoo and then Oregon, Oregon State for the Civil War. Uh, but key guy for me to watch, I mean, obviously – Damian Martinez is the guy there. Uh, very explosive, dynamic back. I think you got to feed him the football, Cody. Um, and, it, and it's an advantage for them because they can run the football with him too. Um, and he's got 350 yards this year. I think they got to give him the ball. But I'm going to throw it back to you and talk the quarterback side with DJU. He looks pretty good right now. He looks very comfortable in this offense with Jonathan Smith as the head coach. But Talk about DJU and what he needs to do in a big game. This is his first Pac-12 game, not only Pac-12 game, but on the road. And it's going to be loud there at Wazoo. Yeah, you know, I mean, <clears throat> against some pretty not great um, competition, he has two picks. Okay, I get it. Six touchdowns, two picks. Three to one interception ratio. Touchdown interception ratio isn't bad. But I'm telling you now, DJU, you cannot turn the ball over on the road in the Palouse. That place is going to be rocking. They've had some great stadium upgrades. It is going to be absolutely lit out there. So it's going to be loud. Can he communicate not only to his receivers, but also to his offensive line to make sure he gets them in the correct protection um, in a very hostile environment? So DJU, um, I think you've had a little bit of a renaissance on your career going out to Oregon State. I think it's been a good, it's good that you have a really powerful running game behind you. Um, but this game screams pack the box, Washington State, and allow those receivers on the outside um, for Oregon State to go one-on-one. -on -one. Silas Bolden, Anthony Gould, um, you two are going to be kind of front and center stage against this Washington State mm -hmm. secondary. Yeah, and then the Oregon State defensive side, they've got to contain Cam Ward. Uh, like we mentioned before with the running game there, he's going to – they can't get the running game going, expect him to run the football a ton. But uh, what, what, real quick before we get to our predictions, Cam Ward, you know, what, what's your analysis of Cam Ward and what can he do, I guess? For this, I think, I think Cam Ward Wazoo. might be one of the more underappreciated and undervalued quarterbacks in the country. I mean, he throws the ball well at all three levels, both all deep, intermediate, short. Um, I think he does a really good job getting the ball out of his hands quick. He has a light and quick release. Um, he doesn't turn the ball over very much, although they did mess around a little bit in their first game of the year. But mm. um, being Colorado State. Mm -hmm. But I think ultimately – Cam Ward has a big game. I think he goes for over 400 yards passing. I think Ooh. DJU is going to need to not match it, but I would say needs to slow the game down. Very similar to what we need Colorado to do at Oregon. Oregon State needs to pound the rock, make sure that they're eight, ten play drives to keep that high-powered Washington State offense off the field. So let's get to our prediction, Cody. Oregon State, Wazoo, who do you like in this matchup, and what's your score? This game is tough. This is a tough one. This one's hard, man. Wazoo coming off the big win over Wisconsin at home. I'm going to have to go because I'm really high on them, and I think that they're just a better team. But shout out to my guy, Michael Bumpus. I'm going to go Washington State 38-35. Cam Ward leads a game-winning drive in the fourth quarter, they kick a field goal to win it. Wow, I'm shocked. I literally wrote down Oregon State because I thought you were going to write pick Oregon State. I was like, oh, he's going to Oregon State. Uh, here we go. Wow. Well, since you're going to Wazoo, I already have this written down. I'm going to Oregon State. I mean, this is a game. Dark horse left on team. Added to the resume, top 14. If they win this, they could go maybe top 12. Even crack the top 10 for Oregon State would be actually ridiculous but i got oregon state in this one and you know what because i'm a funny guy i'm gonna go 38 35 oregon state <laughs> <laughs> i love it no honestly oh, if, this was, if this was if this was in corvallis i'd probably good point say i'd probably say 38 28 beavers but with it being on the palouse i just have a weird things happen on the palouse man it just is what it is weird things happen out in washington state so i'm going wazoo in the upset and it's crazy too because we talked before we got on about how you know, they evened out all of the all of the ranked games. I also think they did a great job with, you know, the toughest environments at night being, you know, Wazoo and the Notre Dame being night games. Like that is just like that that I think that I think a game being at night versus at day makes a huge difference. Absolutely, absolutely. Would have been great to see, you know, Oregon at night against Colorado, but we get it. not everyone can play at night. <sighs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, not at 7.30 again and then end at, like, 12, like it was against Colorado State. <laughs> yeah. But 
<laughs> uh, this next game, and it's another Pac-12 game. Another one. We've got three ranked Pac-12 games. But this one's going to be a good game. 22 UCLA at 11 Utah. Both undefeated. 12-30 on Fox. Utah is favored by four and a half points. Cody, what's the biggest... What's the biggest storyline in your opinion? I think I think I know where you're heading on this, but I want to have you say it. What's the biggest storyline when you look at UCLA versus Utah? Cam Rising, are you playing, bro? Are you playing? Are you back yet? Because yeah. I feel like right now your team will need you in this football game. A couple close close calls in some other games, but right now, Cam Rising, are you going to be able to come back and play for your team? Ultimately, if he does, I think Utah wins this football game. If he doesn't, UCLA and Dante Moore, can you go on the road to Rice Eccles against arguably the best defense, maybe not only in the Pac-12, mm-hmm. but in the, in the country? I don't know. But, yes, biggest yeah. storyline has got to be Cam Rising. Is he playing or not? Yeah, and it's been four games already. and We kind of expected him at Florida. And we expected him at Baylor. Close game. They almost lost the game at Baylor. Then we didn't see him last week against, you know, Weber State. But I agree with you. I think he's got to play this game. If he doesn't, they got to go the quarterback two quarterback system because you got Barnes, who's got the experience and the veteran himself. But you got Jackson, who's a hell of an athlete. Freshman, but a hell of an athlete, a dual threat guy himself. But I think the key matchup for me, and I'm going to throw it back to you, Cody, because you're the quarterback guy. Dante Moore being a quarterback freshman, huge test. He's looking great. It's so funny because the first game was Ethan Garber's. And then they put Dante Moore in against Coastal Carolina, and he scored two touchdowns. It was like he was three or four, two touchdowns, like 150 yards or whatever. And they're like, yeah. okay, like, boom, boom, boom. We fucked up. We <laughs> fucked up. All right. All right. Dante Moore, we just, we wanted to get you some competition, a little diversity there. But um, two part question What does Dante Moore need to do against Utah? And then, you know, freshman quarterback, road environment. He's a five star. He's, he's experienced a lot of pressure before, but not much there in Salt Lake. It's going to be loud at 1230. Dante Moore, take what that defense gives you. Utah does a really good job of getting pressure with just four. They don't need to necessarily blitz mm-hmm. so because they're so stout in the front four. So that means that they're going to be able to cover down with close to six or seven guys. So what that means is intermediate, underneath, drags, whips, slants, hitches. Those are going to be there. Digs at the second level of the defense in, the, in certain windows. Make sure, take what the defense gives you. Check downs. If he starts to try and push the ball down the field and turns the ball over two, three times against this Utah defense, that red Mm -hmm. wave of student section is going to get louder and louder and louder. And I think ultimately Utah will be able to start running the football and kind of suck the life out of this game. So ultimately I think that Utah um, has a better football team, but when you have a dynamic quarterback like Dante Moore, um, who hasn't turned the ball over except for once this year um, and has seven touchdown passes, in, if you think about it, like two two real games. Mm-hmm. So um, I think that he's every bit the five-star label that he got. Um, I think that right now UCLA is in a good position because similar to Colorado State going into Colorado, they're the underdog, okay? Um, can they keep it close? And can Dante Moore perform on the road in his first big, big test? A key player for me to watch for Utah, a guy that just started playing again. He was off an injury. Um, He played last week and the week before. Uh, Not a whole lot of yards so far, only 30 yards, but a guy that was dynamic in 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 the tight end room that they're known for at Utah is Thomas Yasmin. We saw him in the Pac-12 championship, two touchdowns last year against USC. I expect him, being the veteran, senior guy, them to look to him, especially if Cam Cam Rising's not there. Cam Rising's there, that's his favorite target. If he's not there – Look for Jackson and Barnes to look and lean on him. But, Cody, when you look at this, who are some guys that kind of catch your eye? Oh, and also, I got to mention, UCLA, Carson Steele. Their ability mm-hmm. to run the football, they're averaging 6.5 yards, I think, a carry or something like that. I saw a stat that uh, Joel Clyde had. UCLA is able to run the football without Charbonnet. It's a guy transferred from Ball State, Carson Steele. Um, I like him a lot. He kind of reminds me of Peyton Hillis type or that mm-hmm. Toby Gearhart reminds me of those type backs. Those are my two players, UCLA and Utah, to watch out for. What about you? Yeah, you know, um, Chip Kelly does a really good job in his run game preparation. So I wouldn't be surprised if you see a couple little wrinkles for UCLA. Um, To me, it's Money Parks 
on, on offense for Utah. Money Parks had a great deep ball touchdown to start the season off on their first play of the year against Florida. And I feel like he's kind of kind of drifted to the background. Money Parks, UCLA is going to load the box. You're going to get a lot of one-on-one opportunities against that UCLA secondary. Can Dante Moore, or sorry, can Nate Johnson or, or Cam Rising, because I think mm. Nate Johnson gets to start in this game, but can Cam Rising and or Nate Johnson find Money Parks deep against this UCLA secondary because he's a dynamic athlete, absolute speedster. Um, I think he could be the key to victory for Utah. Prediction time, Cody. UCLA, Utah, another tough one. Utah's biggest test, UCLA's biggest test here. But for me, I think it comes down to the defense against a freshman quarterback. I mean, yes, Dante Moore is a hell of a talent. He's going to be a great quarterback. And, you know, next year and the year after, he's going to be you know, probably first-round pick. But I got Utah winning this one. I think it's going to be a low-scoring game, lower than people think. I'm going to go 21-17. Mm-hmm. What about you? What about you? I know. Low scoring, low scoring. I have Utah. 24-21. Next game, we're going to the SEC. We're flying over from Salt Lake to Tuscaloosa, Alabama, where Alabama will be playing Ole Miss. 15 Ole Miss at 13 Alabama. 12-30 on CBS. SEC on CBS. Let's freaking go. Alabama's favored by seven. Seven, a little interesting there. A big spread off of a team that looked bad against USF. But we talked about Jalen Melrose earlier. Maybe that off-the-field stuff kind of earned him that starting spot, or maybe the struggles of the quarterback last week earned him that starting spot. But you got Jalen Melrose and Nick Saban versus Lane Kiffin and Jackson Dart who were sniffing for redemption. What is your biggest storyline thing that you're going to look out for in this SEC battle? I called this in the prediction episode. I called it last episode. Uh. Ole Miss is going to roll into Tuscaloosa and get the job done. Ole Miss, Jackson Dart, this is your time to shine. You lead your team in passing. Believe it or not, even with Quinshot Junkins in the backfield, you lead your team in rushing. Okay. This is a great opportunity for Jackson Dart to truly take a huge leap and allow Ole Miss to beat Alabama and put them out of their misery. On the other side of it, for me, I think this is a a proven game for Jalen Milrow to kind of shut up people about his game in the quarterback room and Alabama being the dynasty's over or they're not going to, they're going to win, they're going to lose four games. I'm going to stay on it because I said I thought Alabama was going to beat Texas when I saw what Quinn Ewers did to beat Alabama. I just don't think Jackson Dark can do that against his Alabama defense. I think they're hungry. They're back. Caleb Downs can play the entire game. He was out that second half, third, fourth quarter, I believe, um, due to some stomach virus he had, I think. I, I, I forget what they said, but I think Alabama, I think they win big. I think it's a statement game for him here. But, I mean, it's going to be tough for Ole Miss. On the other side, they're going to have to feed um, – you mentioned the running back. He's really good. He's got a really tough name to pronounce, but it's Quinshaw a really Junkins. sick name. Quinshaw Junkins um, on the you know on this on the offensive side of the ball. But I'm excited to see Lane Kiffin again, another assistant of Nick Saban, going into the road game, going into playing Nick Saban at Alabama. We mentioned the last time with Steve Sarkeesian. I think it was the first time that an assist. Or it was the first time a road team's come in and beat them by double digits. I think that's mm. the right. A home mm-hmm. game or Since whatever, 2007. You know that Crimson Tide fan base is going to be loud because they don't want to lose two home games in a row. So we lead into our predictions. I'm going Alabama. I think they went big. I think this is a, a big game. I mean, this might shock some people in my score here. But I'm going 30 to 14 Alabama. I think they win by two possessions, two touchdowns. <laughs> Jalen Murrow. Goes for 100 yards rushing, and he scores two touchdowns, and he also throws for two more. Give me Alabama. They win big, 30-14. How do you beat Alabama? (laughs) Okay. Great quarterback play. Receivers that can win on the outside. You can score and win on the outside. You have a chance to beat Alabama, especially when they have a down year at quarterback. This Mm. isn't Bryce Young. This isn't Tua Tagovailoa. This isn't even Jalen Hurts. Jalen Milrow is going to turn the ball over two times. The last time he turned the ball over two times, what happened? They lost to Texas in Tuscaloosa. Jackson Dark 
you use your legs and you get 50 to 60 yards rushing, Quinshawn Junkins, you use mm. your legs, 75 to 80 yards rushing, maybe about 100 yards rushing. Jackson Dart takes shots downfield in play action to Jordan Watkins and Dayton Wade. Ole Miss, mm. 38, Alabama, 35. Ooh. Field goal. You know, I got to mention, Cody, you've gone field goal game for four out of five right now. Wow. <laughs> They're ranked games. They're supposed to be close. I know. They are ranked. <laughs> They're supposed to be like that, too. Um, we're making our way to the Big Ten. Big Ten ranked game, which we're both excited about for two reasons. One, 24 Iowa, 3-0. Two, 7 Penn State, 3-0. This game's on CBS as well. Penn State favored by 15 against Iowa. Over-unders at 40. This is this is the whiteout game of the year for Penn State. What sticks out to you when you evaluate 24 Iowa? Great defense, known for a stout defense against seven Penn State with a lot of new talent on offense. Yeah, you know, can Cade McNamara avoid the big turnover against a very good Penn State defense? And on the flip side, can Drew Aller avoid the big turnover? against an extremely talented, albeit underrated, Iowa defense. Remember, folks, this is Drew Aller's first real test against a real defense. So can Penn State get the job done? Drew Aller kind of struggled last week to start the game against Illinois. So I think that ultimately it comes down to Drew Aller and Cade McNamara against their, those respective defenses and who's going to turn the ball over more. Mm. I think with Iowa, they showed last week that they could score. Um, they scored 48 points against Western Michigan. Yes, there's only Western Michigan there. But I think they're lucky that they've got a guy who's already played at Penn State before. You look back to November 13, 2021. Cade McNamara, 19-29, to 29, 217 yards, three touchdowns against Penn State. If you remember Penn State that year, bad year for me. went 6-4, and four, however. And at the time, I think they were a top 25 team. But um, I agree with you. I think, you know, Kane McNamara there, but on the other side, Drew Aller. Let's see him against a you know a veteran defense in Iowa. They're known for their defensive backs and their and their front seven there. I'm stoked to see Drew Aller. You know he's a guy that's kind of training up in the high direction. Joe Klatz mentioned him. He did a whole breakdown on on Drew Aller, but um, but yeah, I mean, can they run the football with their two running backs and uh, their two best players in Allen and I'm blanking on the other guy's name, Nick Singleton. Nick Singleton. Anything else that stick out to you when you watch this Iowa-Penn State game for those fans and listeners watching that want to get prepared for it? I think ultimately look for Penn State to try and establish the run early. Nick Singleton, Katron Allen in the backfield, arguably, arguably the best one-two punch in the backfield in the country, right? That'll help Drew Aller, like I said, with a lot of other quarterbacks. Whenever you have an effective run game, those play-action fakes, those rollouts, those boots, those RPOs, those zone reads become even more effective, and it opens up deeper shots downfield for those Penn State wide receivers. I think ultimately that's what's going to decide this football game. Can Penn State run the football against a very, very physical uh, Iowa defense? Prediction time, Cody. I'm going Penn State. I think it's close. I don't know, 15. 15 is a lot. Um, and I, I think Iowa's starting to trend up in the right direction too, but I'm going to go 24 20. Penn State wins. Last second touchdown by Drew Aller to Katron Allen. So this one will not be a field goal game. <laughs> because God. I don't think Thank that God. Iowa can score enough. I'm going to go 35 okay. to 20. Penn State. Drew Aller has a big game. Those two backs combined for 150, 180 yards. Um, and I just don't think Iowa can keep up with Penn State. Penn State, whiteout, another bucket list game that we want to go to one day is Penn State, whiteout. Clint to Taylor existed. was able to go to it last year. Shout That's out to insane. the homie on that one. Very jealous that you are able to get to go and do that. 100%. Next game, and this one's not a ranked game, but technically it is because on the coaches poll, Clemson's ranked 23rd. But we've got to mention it anyways, Cody, because this could be a bounce back for Clemson. Um, but – Four, Florida State at Clemson. Mm. You want to talk about spreading out the games? This is mm. the night. This is the nine a.m. This is the game that we get to start out with at nine a.m. Four, Florida State at Clemson. Florida State's favored by two here. Florida State after a game last week, you would think Florida State would be favored by more, but after a scare against Boston College, people are kind of holding back, saying, "Whoa, whoa, 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 Florida State, what's going on here?" 
Florida State, Clemson. Uh, Clemson has been looking good recently. Obviously not great opponents, but what's the key storyline? What sticks out to you when you look at this Florida State-Clemson matchup? Eon Pullman and Johnny Wilson. Can you guys win one-on-one matchups on the outside against this Clemson secondary? Possibly even recognizing double teams because at the end of the day, Clemson is going to try their darndest to not allow them to get off. Mm. Clemson is going to rush four. Hopefully they can get home with four, maybe five, and try and cover down with six or seven defenders in the secondary um, to try and limit limit Jordan Travis and those receivers of Keon Coleman and Johnny Wilson. Uh, a key headline for me, a key player, um, I'm going to go on the Clemson side of this, um, Will Shipley. Did you know that Will Shipley has not scored a rushing touchdown this season yet? Makes sense. He has not scored a rushing touchdown. I think this screams Will Shipley 100 yards. you got to score 100 yards um, against this tough Florida State um, defensive line. And then they got to lead on the running game here. But another one, too, I'm going to throw back to you, Cody. Kate Klubnick, mm-hmm. Garrett Riley, get your shot together between Time. you two. You guys Time. have been looking off. We talked about it. Kate Klubnick. Um, I believe, God, I forget the opponent. I'm going to look at it real quick. Uh, it was a couple weeks ago. They played Charleston Southern. Uh, Char- Charleston Southern, the Buccaneers. I mean, at one point, Char- Charleston Southern was up. I mean, he threw an interception, pick six early. You, you texted me like, Kane Klubnik, WTF. Yeah. What, what are we doing here? <laughs> like, what, what, what are we doing? So um, I'm going to go back to you. What does Kate Klubnik need to do here? And what can these two, Garrett Riley, Kate Klubnik, can they – can they mesh this game? It's a big game for them, big bounce back game. If they want to contend for the ACC. Yeah, I mean, they need it, right? At the end of the day, I think Cade Klubnik cannot turn the foot. I know I keep saying it, like, but the, but it's true. Cade Klubnik but it's, can't. It's true, yeah. It's just true. You can't turn the ball over against good football teams, especially at home when you have the advantage. So, Cade Klubnik, take care of the football, short, intermediate passing game. Use Will Shipley. Make sure you're checking into the correct play, the correct protection. When in doubt, throw it away when you get pressure. Florida State has a very aggressive front seven. That'll try try and get after you and make it tough. They're probably going to load the box against Will Shipley. That means there's going to be opportunities for you and those receivers to get open. Bo Collins, Antonio Williams, Tyler Brown, Adam Randall. Shoot, even screens screens and passes to Will Shipley coming out of the backfield. Those guys, along with Cade Klubnik, if they can, in the passing game, positively affect the game, 300 yards passing, mm. maybe three, four touchdowns, Clemson will have a great opportunity to win this football game and really create some momentum for that crowd to kind of get loud in Death Valley and make it tough on Jordan Travis and that Florida State offense. I'm stoked. Jordan Travis, this scream, this, this game, title, bounce back. For Florida State and Clemson, bounce back. Mm-hmm. They bounce back. ACC, they've been impressive all year. Um, we'll see who comes out on this top, on this matchup here. But for me, Cody, oh, it's so tough because Clemson can be such a great environment. Oh, it you is. Know, Dallas Sweeney is going to get the guys there. fired up. Nine a.m. Oh my god, that's early. Over the obviously, what is it? They're they're uh, it's noon for them. Noon. Okay, they're Eastern time zone. Um, but for me, I think Florida State has too much talent. And you mentioned Keon Coleman and Johnny Wilson on the outside. I see screams, big games out of those two. I'm going Florida State. Um, I think they win, but I think it's going to be close. I'm going to go 34 to 27, Florida State. So we talked about it being our one-year anniversary, right, today. Yep. So 10 years ago, a kid named Jameis Winston took Florida State on the road to Clemson. Clemson was considered maybe the better team at the time. They had recruited better, but Jameis Winston took Florida State into Death Valley and ran roughshod over the Tigers in a big win that kind of catapulted Florida State to actually a national championship that year against Auburn. Jordan Travis, this is your stage, my dude. Can you get the job done? I don't know. Oh, man. Clemson at home. If it was a night game, I'm 100% taking Clemson. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know it's going to be packed regardless. 28 24 Florida State. They get the job done. I think it was a look ahead game at Boston College last week. I think they show up, they show out. Jordan Travis throws a touchdown late, and Florida State's defense comes up with a big turnover with like a minute to go because Kate Klibnick throws a pick. 
Love it. And with that, the top seven matchups we just previewed, all seven for you. Good work, sir. We're going to do two more quick ones. Two more quick ones that are unranked matchups, but we think these are key matchups in terms of later on things with the Big 12 and the SEC. So, and maybe even a coach getting fired. We'll ex- I'll explain in just a second. Auburn at Texas A&M. Speaking mm. of coach fired, I mean, I mean, I mean, you look at Texas A&M, what they did last week. Is Texas a- I mean, is Miami good or is Texas A&M bad? You know, we'll, we'll find out in this game. Auburn 3-0 this season, led by Peyton Thorne, the Michigan State transfer over there at Auburn. And then Texas A&M, led by Connor Weigman, a guy that you said was going to be the SEC freshman of the year. He leads Texas A&M after a tough loss against Miami last week or it two weeks ago. I think they were on bye this last week. Um, but Texas A&M is favored by seven and a half points at Kyle Field. This will be a 9 a.m. game as well. What sticks out to you when you look at this matchup here, Cody? Kyle Field. The fact that it's on the road. Peyton Thorne has not had the opportunity to play an SEC road game like this yet. Kyle Field is unique. Over 100,000 people down there in Aggieland. I think that simply the home field advantage favors Texas A&M. But remember... I said Texas A&M was only going to win four games this year. Mm. Can they beat Auburn and actually keep, you know, like I just don't know, can Auburn run the football well enough against Texas A&M? I think they can. Robbie Ashford comes in in those wildcat packages at quarterback to kind of spell Peyton Thorne. Maybe they throw a couple trick plays that Auburn's used to. Um, Hugh Freeze is a guy who's been known to kind of throw trick plays out there. Maybe Robbie Ashford and Peyton Thorne are on the field at the same time. Who knows? We'll see. I think that right now that Texas A&M is trending in the wrong direction. I think Auburn is surprisingly 3-0. and No disrespect to the teams they played against. Ooh, who wins this game? Yeah, it's tough. You got Hugh Freeze on the other side, first-year head coach. You got Jimbo Fisher. A hot seat kind of game here. I mean, we I, had a bunch of expectations. He was your biggest letdown. One of your biggest letdowns we had on the, one of the episodes we had early on. Uh, I mean, you look last week, Bill, Billy Napier was a hot seat game. They win that against Tennessee. And then you've got, you know, Texas A&M and Jimbo Fisher there. For me, Cody, before I go to you, obviously, I'm just going to go my prediction real quick. Uh, I got A&M in this one. I think they just got the better athletes. I think they can run the football there. Um, I trust A&M and being at home, too. I know it's a boring answer there, too. But, I mean, Jimbo Fisher, bounce back game. It's going to be cool, though. Jimbo Fisher versus Hugh Freeze. I think it's going to be a low-scoring game. I'm going to go 2017, Texas a and Good call. Yeah, I'm going to go Texas A&M, barely. I'm going to go 20 to 19, similar to the Texas-Alabama game last year. And then the second one, we got to mention them because you had them. You have this team in your Big 12 championship. They still look pretty hot right now. They're undefeated right now. UCF against Kansas State at Kansas State. Kansas State, a team that lost a nail-biter, a tough way to lose against UCF last week. Um, 61 yard field goal, unfortunate for them. They're two and one this season. This game is at 5 p.m. on FS1. Kansas State, they were by four and a half points. Night game at Manhattan, gonna be tough. But again, UCF, they looked good last week against with the backup quarterback. John Reese probably, unfortunately, is not playing this game. But what sticks out to you about UCF? And you still, do you still feel good about UCF making the Big 12 championship? I do. I do. Okay. I think. I think, like I said in our prediction episode, they've recruited SEC country really, really well. They've dipped into Georgia to start grabbing some guys. Also, guys in the transfer portal have decided to come to UCF. Um, So I think they have enough depth to be able to survive the fact that John Reese Plumlee isn't there. Do I think they win this game, though, without him? Ooh. Uh, It's tough. That's tough. tough. I'll say this. Remember the name. Toby Hudson, receiver for UCF, absolute baller on the outside. Can he win one-on-one matchups? Because you already know Kansas State's probably going to pack the box and try and make this backup quarterback throw the football um, against some long, very athletic and physical DBs for Kansas State. Yeah, and I know it was Villanova last week, but his name is Timmy McLean for UCF, the starting quarterback now because John Reese Pony's out. 20-28, 321 yards, two touchdowns. Um, good performance for him. For UCF, uh, my, my key point here for UCF, I think they got to lean on the running game to obviously relieve the pressure of Timmy McClain. Um, you know, if they got to run the football. It's always that when you got a backup quarterback or you got an unexperienced quarterback, run the football, make it easier on his life. Um, and some of those passes will be open on later on. But this screams Will Howard piss mode. I'm pissed. 
we lost Mizzou on piss. I want to get back. Big 12 game. Um, for me, Cody, I want to go UCF here, but I got to go Kansas State being at home. Um, I think another close game, uh, ish close game. I'm going to go 28 to 20, Kansas State. RJ Harvey has 150 yards rushing. Use the F. <laughs> Respect. Respectfully, loses 28 27 to Kansas State, but they're still in the hunt for the Big 12 championship. God, I, I hate you, bro, because I'm literally writing this in Sharpie and I put UCF because you got my ass. <laughs> you got my ass. You got my ass again, dude. But, man, what other show breaks down nine games for you this weekend? I don't know who does it. I don't know who does nine. Yes, it's a longer episode, but you got more content so you can be prepared for this weekend while you sit, drink that nice cold beer, relax, watch college game day in the morning, and then finish up the night with Notre Dame, Ohio State. Mm. Cody, we talked about all the top games. But let's get into our upset picks as well as our up, our teams on upset alert. Upset picks. We're both 0-2 right now. This is screaming redemption here for us. But, Cody, what is your upset pick of week four? They almost did it against Utah a couple weeks ago. Dave Aranda is a ridiculous defensive coach. Baylor will shock the country and knock off Texas at home. Baylor over Texas. That's my upset pick of the week. Are you sure? Yep. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, wow. That would totally shake up, you know, not only the CFP, but, man, those Texas fans on such a high. We love Quinn Ewers. We just beat Alabama. You know, we went three quarters with Wyoming, but we still beat Wyoming. They're fair by 15. Man, that would just be a decline. WTF, Texas, if that happens. I like it. <laughs> I'm staying in the Big 12. I'm going BYU over Kansas. Keen Slovis has been looking great at BYU. Kind of, you know, maybe he's found his fit there at BYU. Um, Kansas, tough. They they barely beat Nevada. That kind of threw me for a loop there. I love Jalen Daniels, but that kind of threw me for a loop. At Kansas, can be a tough place to play, but give me BYU against Kansas. And real quickly, Cody, I'm going to look at the line here if I can find it. But but while I look at the line here, um, your thoughts about BYU over Kansas? BYU just had a big win on the road at Arkansas, which mm. a Big 12 team, a new Big 12 team going on the road, to another SEC team and beating them is super impressive. Um, I think BYU will probably end up winning this game as well. I just don't think that mm. Kansas is physical enough up front to withstand uh, the rushing game as well as the front four and front seven of uh, BYU on the defensive side of the ball. Both teams undefeated. Kansas favored by eight and a half. Wow. That's a lot. That's oh, way, I'm shocked. That's way too big of a line. I'd take the – yeah, I'd take points on that immediately. Yeah, plus, plus eight and a half for BYU. I definitely would do that too. Um, teams on upset alert. And I'm going to go first, Cody, because I think I have, I have a feeling who you're going to go with. Or, again, you could go with another team as well. But, uh, again, it's tough to play. We mentioned all the time teams with nothing to lose, especially at home. Mm -hmm. Oklahoma, upset alert. Not saying they're going to lose this game. They're favored by 14 and a half points. But, again, Emory Jones has been looking good. They lost a weird game against Miami, Ohio last week with Cincinnati, but it's going to be screaming there at 9 a.m. We'll see against we'll see Oklahoma. Dylan Gabriel has been looking hot. Cincinnati's defense are usually kind of known for that defense there. Sorry, but what did you say about Dylan Gabriel? He's been looking all right. I think I said <laughs> right. I, I think you might have you might have heard hot. I said all right. You know, it's kind of similar words there. But yeah, I mean, this might be the game. I mean, you look at Oklahoma's schedule right now. They've got Cincinnati this week. And then they've got Iowa State at home, and then they've got Texas. So this would be kind of a good win for them to open up the Big 12 there. But Oklahoma on upset alert for me. Well, what about you, sir? Not a bad pick. I had them on upset alert last weekend against – or two weekends ago against SMU, so I get it. Hmm. But North Carolina going on the road to Pittsburgh. I get it. Pittsburgh's taking a couple of L's early in the season. But North Carolina, do not play. That is a tough road trip. It's always hard to play at Pittsburgh. North Carolina hasn't done great on the road in conference recently. So North Carolina, be aware, Drake May, you got to come back and ball out, my guy. You haven't really had one of those big, big games. 
to make everybody be like, mm. oh, yeah, that's the possible number one pick over Caleb Williams. Yeah, yeah this might be an fact. opportunity. Yeah, he's been kind of average. And his receiver unit obviously is worse than last year and, you know, sucks FU NCAA for still not having Tez Walker play. Uh, makes no sense, especially when he had – I think he had a transfer in order to still play. I think he's a grad transfer too. Yeah. Again, don't understand how that works. But, um, yeah, I love the picks there. I love the upsets. And with that, that wraps up our week four breakdown. But hold on, folks. We've got our top ten to do. Our collaborative top ten week four. Cody, I bring up our week three from last week. We had Georgia, Michigan, Texas, Florida State, USC, Washington, Penn State at seven, Notre Dame at eight, Oregon at nine, Bama at ten. So without further ado, sir, let us do our the point afters official rankings heading into week four. And I believe we still agree Georgia, Michigan, right? Georgia, Michigan, one, two. I think they're just, like okay. I said, they're suffering from success, the, the doldrums of success right now. One and two, Georgia, Michigan. Uh, Texas three? I don't know. Texas, Florida State, they both looked eh last week. But, again, with respect of their wins, do we keep Texas there and Florida State at four? I think we keep Texas at three. But Florida State out of four. Yes. I think I know where you're going with four, and I would be down for that as well. Washington, Washington at four. Washington, yes. man. Washington at Washington four. Huskies, man. Listen, Bro. The Washington Huskies arguably are the best team in the country right now. Arguably. You, they, can make a, they, they can make an argument. Don't kill me in the comments. Look. Look at who they played. Look at what they've done. Look at the balance. Not only offensively, but defensively. They've been okay. I'll, I'll rephrase that. They've been the most impressive hmm. so far. They play Cal this week. They should win seven thirty late night game. It'll be bumping over there in Seattle. Then they go at Arizona, which was a game that you said early on in the season um, that could shake up the rankings. Again, they play bad in Arizona, so that'll be a game to watch out for as well. I love Washington. They jump up from six to four in our rankings. Yep. I like that a lot. Are we four state at five? Or we jumping them down to six. I'd put them at six, and I'd put USC above them. Like Fine USC's, with that. Fine with that. I think USC's been a little bit more impressive. I think Caleb Williams is just like leaps and bounds better than he was last year when he won the Heisman, which is ridiculous. Mm -hmm. So, uh, mm -hmm. and that defense has improved. So, you know, USC at five. We had Penn State at seven last week. We had Notre Dame at eight. I think we keep Penn State at seven. Your thoughts? I think we keep them there as we keep well. Keep them at seven. I think we keep Notre Dame at eight. I think yep. we keep those the same. Yep. Penn State at seven. Notre Dame at eight. Nine. We had Oregon last week. Oregon played Hawaii. Smacked them. I like them nine. Oregon, man. I like them. I don't, think they, I don't think they moved down. Yeah. I like yeah them. I don't, this might be the quickest rankings we've ever done. We haven't really argued much here. But the 10 spot, I'm going to argue Ohio State. Here's why. They looked good last week. They're getting better. Plus, who doesn't love a top 10 matchup, Cody? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. I mean, do you think the, the, for the 10 spot for me, it's got to be either between Ohio State, Utah, or LSU? For me, it's got to be Ohio State because they're undefeated, and their undefeated record is, to me, although Utah did beat Florida, who did beat Tennessee, mm. I think that's kind of getting too deep into it. I think if you lined up Ohio State and Utah right now, Ohio State wins. Ohio State gets the nod ahead of their big tilt with Notre Dame. So we do have an official top 10 matchup in our rankings. Love it. That was probably the easiest rankings that we've had all season. But we're on the same page. And for those who are wondering, you can't see because the lighting's bad. But I got all my notes over here. And I'm hoping that we continue this throughout the season. Because this, these notes are getting higher and higher, Cody. And I think by the time, hopefully, you see the football as a reference. Hopefully by the, by the season, it's like way up here. <laughs> That'd be nice. That'd be super nice. But great episode, Cody. We brought it today. I mean, the most breakdowns that we've done, the most games we've talked about, and de de deservingly so. We're only at week four. Only at week four, Cody. Oh, God, I love college week football. Four. Best week of the year well, so far. Let's get it. Yeah, and last statement, Joel Klatt said it, and I think he said it best. There's 11, 12 teams that could win the national championship, Absolutely. which we love to see. There's not one great team that we've seen yet, but there's a lot of teams that we love to see that can contend. So 
Well, you know where it is. The point after your favorite college football show podcast, episode 12. For Cody Oaks, I'm Jackson Groff. We will see you on Monday with our reactions recap episode of week four. Peace.